G'day. Um, my name is Peter Jacquot. Uh, here to talk to you about some pancakes today. Um, so I'm a senior security consultant at Quantum Security. Um, I have a background in electrical engineering. Uh, in my spare time, I like to break things, most of it. Um, I enjoy cats, cars, and crappy electronics. So, about three or four months ago, I was surfing trade me as I do, trying to find a CNC machine to buy, and I came across a pancake maker and was like, I have to absolutely have this. I have no idea what I want to do with it. And so I just bought it immediately. And then figured that I bought a pancake maker, why not try and put it on the internet? Because that sounds like a really great idea to do. So I'm just going to have a bit of a chat about kind of what, what the pancake bot is, um, how it used to work, uh, what I've done to it, how it works now, and what I still need to do to it. Cool. So the pancake bot was some dude's great idea to um, yeah, try and automate pancake making because that's a really sweet thing to do. Um, he made it originally out of like Lego and Technics and stuff for his kids. Um, a whole bunch of people on the internet thought that was pretty cool. So he went and created the Kickstarter for it. A couple hundred thousand um, bucks later, a whole bunch of them were released onto the market. And I think now it's into version two or three. Um, yeah, so essentially what it is, it's just a two-axis CNC machine. So it's like a 3D printer without one of the axes. Um, you feed it G-code, just like a 3D printer, um, and it prints pancakes in any shape you want. Um, it also comes with a bit of uh, software that goes and you can design things as well, so it makes the G-code for you so you don't have to go and write 2,000 lines of G-code. Um, so I guess going back, what's CNC? So um, computer, computer numerical control is just a way to go and control um, what's primarily been industrial machines. So it's been around since about the 50s. And it's the way that um, old machinists and stuff used to be able to go and try and automate things like uh, CNC lathes and um, milling machines and stuff. So rather than having to go and repeat the same process over and over again, you can just go and program it, design it once, and then let it go and then you don't have to sit there going and measuring and checking to make sure that everything looks the same. Um, that's kind of come reasonably far, especially in the last 10, 15 years, where it's come from being an industry thing to being something that you can have in your own home, um, like laser cutters, 3D printers, um, kind of CNC mills and stuff are now within the price range of an average person, I guess. Um, a 3D printer can, you can now pick up for like 500 bucks, um, you can get a laser cutter for a couple grand uh, versus 10, 15 years ago that might have been like 20 or 30 grand. Um, cool. So I got this working last night uh, and in theory this should work, but the web server just wasn't standing up a couple minutes ago. So I will attempt to do a demo. And that's not going at the moment, so I'll talk through it, and then if it does start working, we can go through it. Um, so essentially, you go and pick an image, um, import it into its software, um, where it goes and vectorizes it. So rather than just being like a rasterized image that's a whole bunch of lines, it um, tries to kind of pick point A to point B, so that essentially it's a set of coordinates that you're printing rather than like an image file. Um, that then changes into G-code, so it becomes a whole bunch of line paths to go and follow. And then the G-code looks something like that. So for like what's a pretty simple image is uh, 1,700 lines of code. Um, and yeah, it's mostly just kind of X, Y coordinates telling it where to go. Um, G-code, so that's just the instruction set essentially for CNC machines. It's pretty standardized among um, all the things. It's something that generally dudes in their uh, 50s or 60s know and no one else. Um, and so as part of doing this, I um, wanted to figure out what the, so that I could reverse engineer this machine, I wanted to kind of know what codes it was using and figure it out. It only actually uses about 10 different ones. So um, the kind of main ones are the G commands where it's um, like the G00, where it sets an X and Y place to go. 
Uh, it can set a speed so it can go anywhere from hellishly slow to still not particularly fast because it's just on um, pretty shaky uh, bands rather than like actual um, rigid axis. Uh, there's some pause commands. Uh, you can home the thing. Turn motors on and off. Um, and then the pump on and off is probably kind of one of the most important things of this. So there's a receptacle of pancake mix. And um, hopefully it's not like cooking itself in there. Um, and inside there, there's just a pump with uh, two valves. And so that can either suck it up and keep a vacuum or it can push it out and create sweet, sweet designs. Uh, because I can't get that web server up at the moment, this is just like an example of it printing. Um, so it's reasonably quick. Uh, for like a simple design, it might take maybe three or four minutes. Um, for more complicated things, I've had something running this morning for about 20 minutes, which gets a bit tiresome. Um, and in this, you can see that I did a really crappy consistency pancake mix, and therefore it's like squiggling out. Um, if you do a better job, then it kind of actually makes nice, pretty designs. Cool. And then you get a pancake, and it is apparently delicious. Um, cool. So I bought this thing, and then immediately I pulled it apart, because that's what you do when you are an engineer, and you get bored. So um, I pulled it apart and found out that it had, um, so its main control board was an Atmega 2560 um, micro on it, which is the same as what a um, Arduino 2560 has on it. Uh, it had a controller board with SD card and LCD support, uh, pretty big chunky power supply. Um, it's just got cheap like uh, NEMA stepper motors, so exactly the same thing as you'd find in like a normal 3D printer. Um, it's got its air vacuum pump and a couple of micro valves. Um, so it's pretty basic kind of components, and doing a bit of a Google through it, figured out that actually that lines up perfectly with what kind of open source stuff is out there, um, and that all they'd done was kind of essentially rip a design off kind of the open source uh, 3D printer and put a pump in there instead. Um, they were very nice though, and they've gone and thrown the firmware up online, um, and for what, what they've done there is they've just gone and ripped the, uh, what's called Marlin, um, 3D printing firmware. And so that's all open sourcing on GitHub. Um, it was really great that they threw it up, but they didn't comment anything, so you couldn't actually tell what they'd done to the base image, so you just had to go and um, uh, compare the two files and try and do a diff. Um, they'd also based it on an old version of Marlin that's like quite a few years old now, so as part of what I did, I threw it on the latest version. Um, and kind of the biggest issue that I found with it was that the USB port on the side of it didn't work, which was really not that useful when you're trying to go and connect it to the internet and you don't want to have to be plugging in and out of SD card all the time. Um, so I flicked a message to the, um, to the founder of the company uh, and asked him if he had any idea why they had that limitation in there, and he had no idea. Um, plugging it into a machine, listening to the serial port, you could see that it came up and then it just like killed it about uh, three or four seconds into the connection, and that was kind of all I thought about it at that point. Um, so the pros of it when I bought it was that it was tidy and small, it was well supported, it did stuff easy, and it worked. Uh, but that's no fun. So you can only do a small volume of pancake mixture. That SD card thing really sucks. Um, you have to be right beside the printer to make anything from it. Uh, it makes it really hard to automate when you've got to like actually walk over to it and put stuff in. And wireless SD cards only work the other way, not putting stuff onto it. Um, it's not nearly complicated enough. And you know it actually worked, and that's no fun. So the current-ish state, as of a couple days ago, um, so I thought I was really, uh, so I figured as part of this, I'll go and update the firmware. I thought I'd found the line of code that um, was why it was limiting the USB uh, port on it. So I went and changed that. Um, plugged it into my PC, uh, jumped in the Arduino IDE, and went and tried to upload it to it. And it looked like it was going really well until it bricked the uh, controller, and I couldn't do anything. Um, and so then it wouldn't even respond to uh, 
It wouldn't respond to its SD card, and I couldn't plug it, the USB in. Um, all serial connections seemed to die. So that was really cool. And I was like, I've got to go and talk with these sides soon. This is a bit shit. Um, so I'll just go and try and re-engineer it, because it sounded like it was some pretty open source stuff. Um, and then I jumped on TradeMe and found a second one for sale, so I bought that just in case I screwed up again. Um, so this was kind of how I was playing on architecting it, my really fancy uh, UML diagram. Um, so there's the, on the right, you've got the Pancake Maker. Uh, what the original controller was, so the 2560, I just replaced that with an Arduino 25, uh, Mega 2560, which are just really nice and cheap. Um, onto that, I threw something called a ramps board, and that's essentially just the pinout on the top um, so that you can go and drive your motors and uh, control your end stops and stuff. Um, so there's a couple of little motor drivers in there as well, and that just went back to the original motors that came with it. Um, that's been controlled by Raspberry Pi uh, running something called OctoPrint, um, and that's just like a, essentially I've just stood that up as a web server um, that you can connect in, and that talks over serial to the Arduino and then controls the motors. Uh, there's just a tiny little um, wireless access point in there and just to add, make it a bit more fun, I threw in a couple um, Wi-Fi relays to go and control the power for it. So um, these are just like, I bought them uh, previously for a different project, but they're just like $5 um, Wi-Fi relays, super cheap from China, and then you can just flash your own um, firmware on there to make them kind of play well with uh, home kit and stuff, and now they've got an API and all that jazz. So now all you've got to do is navigate to a web UI, upload some G-code, uh, print the pancake, you get a uh, message in the Slack channel when the pancake prints, and prop it. Um, so the ramps board I was talking about, um, while it looks a little bit complicated up there, it's not actually too bad. Uh, in the middle, there's like an X and Y um, section, and so that just holds the motor driver, which are just little things, um, control the power of the motor. Uh, that then wires out to the two motors. Um, the top right of the picture is uh, the end stop controls. So that's just so that when it goes and hits the end, it knows to go and stop and not just keep charging on with the motor and burn them out. Um, kind of top left is the control for the pump. So it's just a switched um, 12 volt supply, and then there's just a power input on the left. Um, so I was saying before that it was that the firmware is based on this Marlin firmware, and so that was created for a bunch of 3D printers, um, and it's just a whole bunch of C code. Uh, it runs on um, Atmel microcontrollers, so it runs on uh, Arduinos, and it's kind of a fully featured G code set. And as I said before, there's only actually like 10 G-code commands that this thing uses, so that's more than enough. Um, there's a really big community to it, which is great in some cases and terrible in others. So the forums for it are really useful when you're trying to figure some things out, and in other ways, they just point you in the totally wrong direction because no one knows what they're talking about. Um, so there's only actually two real files to go and that you're gonna modify when you um, pull this down. And so there's a config and a config um, advanced file, and these are two just, um, essentially big long C files of a couple thousand lines each. And it's just a case of, I figured out what changes they'd made when they um, configured their version, and then I tried to copy that over to, um, to my version of Marlin, and then also make some extra changes we needed to attempt to make it a bit better. Um, the Raspberry Pi is just a stock standard Raspberry Pi um, running an OctoPi Raspberry image. Um, being a uh, Raspberry Pi, there's heaps of room for expansion. So there's all the GPIO ports that you can use if you want. Um, and it allows for things like cameras to be plugged in. So when I had this at home, I had like a webcam above it so that I can lie in bed and see my pancake cooking. Um, Octoprint is, uh, so I was thinking of like writing my own little front end for it and just being kind of like a, you drop the file in, it prints, and then in five minutes you go and wander through and check it out. Um, and then thinking back, oh, this is actually pretty much a 3D printer. Someone must have done this before, as these guys had. So um, OctoPrint's like a, essentially a fully featured like 3D printing controller over the web. Um, it's quite extendable. There's heaps of um, 
plugins for it. Uh, you can do great things like send yourself messages to your Slack channel or text you when it um, completes. And you can also like, um, there can be a web chat and stream and you can do time lapses of your prints as well because that is completely necessary. Um, while I was prototyping it, I also used this bit of software uh, called Pronterface. And that was just a nice easy way just to be able to plug in with the USB into the controller and um, kind of be able to get instant stuff where I knew that I wasn't having issues because of uh, the, um, the web side of it. Uh, th these are the wireless relays that I was talking about. They're real cheap as chips. Um, they're based on an ESP chip. And there's just a um, four pin serial header on it. So you plug that in, plug it into your laptop and flash some decent firmware on there. Um, I haven't really actually done a whole lot with them, um, but they're kind of in there and for further expansion and playing. Cool. So um, just a couple pictures of the build um, that I did over a few weeks. So top right of the picture is um, there's just a little Wi-Fi access point, uh, the Arduino with the shield on to the kind of bottom right, there's the Raspberry Pi beside that, the um, power supply and then the on the far left and then the um, relays just above those. And it actually looked pretty decent once you got it all together. So kind of my, I guess my process of um, reverse engineering it was figure out what kind of controls I actually needed and that was going through the G code and finding what, um, uh, what codes were used. Um, and then trying to kind of relay those back to what I then needed to go and do on the ramps board. Um, I had to go and pull out all the wiring looms and pin them out to figure out what went where and um, make sure I wasn't trying to short anything out, which I did quite a few times. Um, ripped out the old controller, uh, flashed the modified um, firmware onto the Arduino. Uh, I did it all just on my desk first just to try and eliminate some of the issues of the, the looming. Um, and get frustrated that everything kept breaking all the time. Um, so that's kind of the cost of it. So this thing off the shelf was a couple hundred bucks. Um, Raspberry Pis are pretty cheap. And so that was kind of like the whole thing you can get for like under 300 bucks, which is pretty sweet um, for something that is probably now gonna sit in the cupboard for the next two years. Um, <laughs> but uh, I got most of the stuff from AliExpress just because it's cheap, but it just takes ages to come. Um, I'm building a laser cutter at the same time, so I had a lot of the components already, so that cut had cut out the fact of having to wait for things. Um, trade me for stuff that I wanted a bit quicker, but it's um, always a bit more expensive, and then I try and avoid at all costs going to electronic shops, because they are freaking expensive. So um, some of the things I still want to do with it is uh, customize the web UI a bit further. Um, do some custom G code for like spirographs and like fractals and stuff because kind of anything formulaic makes it really easy to create G code for. Um, throw in a temperature sensor so that you can tell when the hot plates up to temperature without having to be right beside it. Um, do some pressure sensors and controllers. So one of the hardest things to control on this is the um, pressure for the uh, batter if it's too much, then it kind of just splurts out everywhere and you can't actually do any designs. And if it's not enough, then it doesn't come out of the, um, doesn't come out of the bottle. Uh, I reckon having like a, a third axis on it that's just like a big arm that just like whacks pancakes off the end when they're done would be pretty sweet. And you could do that pretty easily by just using the um, Z axis. And then like a self-filling pancake batter receptacle so you don't actually ever have to fill it up again. It just comes out of a bigger tank. Um, but yeah. This was probably the worst, but I just kept blowing stuff up throughout the whole thing. Um, so, like I bricked the controller within the first couple days of owning it. Um, I went through a whole handful of motor drivers because I forgot to put a fan in there and it just kept overheating. Um, I didn't know you could blow up SD cards, but you can. Um, went through a couple of ramps boards, went through a couple of Arduinos, and a lot of that was just kind of shorting 240 volts over things that shouldn't have had 240 volts shorted over them. Um, and a lot of kind of smaller issues like that, just by whenever you're tinkering and things like that happen. Um, so yeah, it needs a cooling fan installed pretty bad. There's also lots of variables with it. Um, pancake batter is really hard to get consistent every time you make it. 
but it is possible. Um, there's also like the uh, heat is quite a big variable to how things turn out, pressure and time. Um, reverse engineering stuff just kind of by its nature sucks a bit and it always takes longer than you'd expect. Um, help for open source so uh, software and hardware is super inconsistent. So I found for some of these components, um, forums and stuff were really useful and like people were more than willing to help and you actually got really good information back. For some of it, it was complete garbage and people just like don't wish to help at all or they want to help and they just give you rubbish answers. Um, the Chinese components are pretty super inconsistent. So like the motor drivers, you can buy a pack of 10 and like three of them just don't work, which makes it really hard to problem solve why something isn't working. And I really don't like pancakes. The missus eats eaten every single pancake off it. Um, so like, are there any useful applications for this? Uh, probably not so much. But um, I reckon you could put some other stuff in there, like chocolate or and make like cool chocolate designs or wax and make candle designs or something. Um, I was searching Geek Zone, or I was searching the internet just for ideas of what people wanted to do with, um, with a pancake maker and some guy wants to make like head gaskets with it, which sounded pretty stupid, but um, I'm sure you could. Uh, there's a dude on YouTube who went and made like a laser cut Vin Diesel out of like ham and cheese. Um, so, that's kind of in the process of doing a pancake Vin Diesel, but I just didn't have the time to actually finish it. Um, and probably the useful one, it's just a really like easy way to actually teach kids about um, CNC and electronics. Uh, hopefully I'll be able to give it to my nieces and they can play around with it. Um, yeah, it's just a, it's a bit more of a practical way to learn than just like playing with a 3D printer that you make a little widget with and then you throw it under your bed and you never use it again. Um, I found the open source. Uh, the guy who made the Vin Diesel bust went and threw them online. So um, yeah, there's just a bit of software called Slicer and essentially you just tell it how thick your slices are gonna be. So in this case, like that much. And um, then it just divides it up, spreads it out over a few pages and then I can just feed that into the um, pancake printer software. Um, I'm just gonna test again to see if that web service come up. Uh, fantastic. Uh, it decided to reset itself, which is cool. Um, Sorry, I'm just gonna exit out of this and Oops. that's not gonna help. Cool. So in theory, if I go and push that and that, might connect. Fingers crossed. Awesome. Um, if you can throw the slides or the laptop back up, um, so I can actually do a run through, which is cool. Um, so this is just a bit of software. Uh, you can just import a image into it, <laughs> and then it just traces it. Cool. Um, so you can either like doodle on here or you can import images. Um, 
its conversion's a bit rough, but uh, if you play around with it long enough, you can make it work. Um, then if you export that for printing, So this is just creating that G code out of those um, images. So it's just trying to essentially vectorize the image on the previous page. Um, that might turn out okay. Now if I go export the file. Cool. Um, and now I can just drag and drop that into the that web GUI. And if all things are going well, hey, yes. Yeah. Oh, that's awesome. I was convinced this wasn't going to work. Um, <laughs> cool. So currently, the, uh, like the pressure is just controlled by like a little knob on there. Uh, I need to kind of automate that some way, but um, I just haven't quite figured that out yet. Um, cool. So while that goes, I can skip through a whole bunch of slides again. Cool. So I figured, like, seeing as I do pen testing during the day, I should probably actually have some idea of like what the security of um, the Octopi software was like. Um, so I did. I just had a look at it the other night. Um, so there's a few hundred of these online. So not not a whole lot, but that is still a few hundred people's houses that can kind of go on fire. Um, so, and just looking through that showdown list, there's a whole bunch that just didn't have. Um, that were just available by just browsing to them. Oh, this is a bit shitty. Um, but yeah, like, so does it really matter that people are throwing these up online? Um, like, 3D printers do kind of catch, catch on fire. Uh, so maybe you should be a little worried about it. Um, so I had a look at it, and there's a few bits of, um, a few things I could do with the Octopi software. Uh, I could just do things like download other people's G-code files from what I found, um, I could watch them print things because they were streaming their webcams online on their printers, which is a bit odd, really. Um, I could restart their 3D printers and possibly burn them down. Um, there were a bunch of like vulnerabilities in the software, though. Uh, there's like arbitrary code execution. Um, there's a bunch of stored cross-site. There's Previsc. Um, I had a look at the issue tracker on their GitHub because they have no other way of disclosing anything. And anytime anyone mentions a security problem, they just start shouting at them. So um, I don't think I'm going to get much luck there actually telling them about it and getting anything fixed. So in the meantime, it's just not going to go online. Um, but yeah, it's got really fun functions. Like you can restart your printer, but rather than just having a button that says restart, you can actually just choose what code it runs. Um, and that's just out of the box. So uh, yeah, it's got full root on the box, um, which is a bit unnecessary. Um, so yeah, up until like last night, I still hadn't got this working properly again. So it used to work, and then I broke it a few times, and I was trying to get it going. And this morning I was um, trying to figure out how to get it going again. And I've been yarning to Fincham last night um, on the boat about how like the firmware thing happened over USB, and that seemed to work, but I just couldn't connect to it over USB, and maybe that was sharing it with like the SD card or something. And so this morning I was like, maybe I should actually just go and like read the firmware update procedure that I never actually read the first time, which is why I bricked it. Um, and it's just like, oh, if you hold the power button for a few seconds, then it all works. So I kind of realized this morning that I didn't actually need to replace anything inside it, and that it worked out of the box <laughs> if you just hold your finger on the power button for three seconds. Um, <laughs> so that was, yeah, a good couple months of work wasted. Um, 
but you know, it's now a much simpler design. There's literally just a web server with a 3D printer plugged into it. Um, yeah, so I built this up this morning, uh, at like five or six in the morning, and it now just all sits inside that box, which is just a web server, those relays, and um, a little bit of power stuff to make it work. Uh, so in theory, or no, I can actually now lie in bed and turn on the hot plate and the printer independently, the web server and the Wi-Fi controller stay on um, anyway, and uh, yeah, I can have delicious, delicious pancakes ready for me without having to even get out of bed. Um, so yeah, one of the reasons I'm wanting to do this was um, I've been do building a laser cutter and I've been doing a um, ramps conversion on that. So not all the work's wasted and I can still use all those parts in that. Um, but yeah, it's just a cheap Chinese laser. Uh, because I'm, I don't like spending a lot of money on stuff like this, I scored it on Trade Me again. Um, and it was really broken. So someone had already blown up that controller before I got to it. Um, and yes, it's like a CO2 laser. You can burn through like three or four mil uh, material. Um, it used to print raster images, uh, which is pretty rough and it just takes ages. So now it'll just be vectors. Um, I'll do that before it leaks. Um, and yeah, so that's pretty much working now. And that's what I'm going to get onto once I kind of this weekend's over, is uh, getting that going again. Um, but yeah, this is the sweet software that that came with, with its original controller. That's the English version of the software. It's um, a bit rough. But yeah, that's kind of its state at the moment. Um, yeah, so thank you for listening to me ramble about pancakes for a while. Um, follow me on Twitter, or I've thrown the, um, I've thrown the firmware that I've done just up on GitHub. Uh, it's not very current at the moment, but I'll sort that out. And um, yeah, and if we flick back to this, it may or may not look any good. <laughs>